how far this extends southwards is a, is, is a big question. But but I see that. But basically, this study is focused in not primarily in North America, and the reason for that is that where that's where much of the data is has been accumulated, and we're for this for the study, and we have fo especially focused in on uh, and trying to understand the North American the, the, the North American situation. Uh, but that does not, of course, exclude the potential that it, that it has wider effects. It's just that we are focused. We tend, we're focusing on where the best data exists. Hi, Betsy Mason, the Contra Costa Times of California. Um, yes. there, you sorry, Betsy Mason from the Contra Costa Times in California. Um, are there other explanations for the onset of the younger dryas cooling that seem at all plausible to you that people have favored before this? Oh yes, There's, in fact I was involved in some of those studies myself beginning 32 years ago and that was the, the, the study that has, there's a lot of debate on this at this moment about the triggering of the younger dryers. You may be aware of that or you may not be, but the, it just has happened really in the last year as it turned out. But until the last year before this debate occurred in the paleoceanographic community, it began to occur in the paleoceanographic community that I belong to, the uh, the, uh, the, the generally accepted hypothesis for the onset of the Young and Dryas cooling was, was that there was a plumbing change, in the, basically a plumbing change of the freshwater outlets from the North America uh, beginning at 12.9 thousand years ago. In other words, there was a switch off of the, of the, of the, the, uh, the freshwater, the overflow water from Lake Agassiz, the meltwater from the Laurentide Ice Sheet from the southern route into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, which uh, at 12.9, in other words, that water went southwards through into the Gulf of Mexico until 12.9 thousand years ago, and then exactly and abruptly at 12.9, there was a sudden switch off of that water, and that went uh, in terms of the accepted, or the accepted or the uh, wisdom, if you like, of the last 20 years. That water went east through the St. Lawrence Seaway into the North Atlantic, and that then that delivered. That suddenly delivered the, the fresh water that actually led to the the freshwater cap, if you like, on, on northern North Atlantic, that then turned off the oceanic conveyor, and uh, that as well illustrated, for instance, in this in the Al Gore movie. If you look at the Al Gore movie, that 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 particular part of the movie actually is really based on what happened at the onset of the Younger Dryas. Uh, and so, but there's been a lot of debate in the community for years as to where the fresh water went. I mean, there's Peltier's work in the Arctic. This is what I'll talk about tomorrow, my talk. Uh, Peltier says, no, the water had to go to the Arctic. And John Andrews would say, no, it went out the Hudson Strait. Or Ted Moore would say, no, it came from the, from the breakup of the, of, the, uh, uh, of the ice shelves in the Arctic and, and in the Fram Strait. Uh, even the Europeans see, see it, actually, 12.9 in the Barents Sea, northern Europe. There's actually evidence of melting of sudden melting at the onset of the Younger Dryas in the Barents Sea, Northern Europe. Uh, then you have, of course, the classic uh, acceptance has been the, uh, which was championed by Wally Broker, is the, uh, uh, is the, the, uh, the flow of um, water into the, through the St. Lawrence Seaway into the, uh, into the North Atlantic. Well, as far as I'm concerned, with the impact hypothesis, is consistent with all that data. Basically, the impact hypothesis provides the, the meltwater around the, the entire periphery of the, of the Laurentide ice sheet. So basically, this is in support of much of the data that's already in the, in the literature. So, um, and there's been debate, there's been debate uh, the last year about um, just where that water is going. And so that, in a nutshell, that's what the debate has been. Uh, Really, where where was the water go? Where was the meltwater going? And it wasn't really a meltwater, a meltwater or a freshwater surge, if you like, that uh, that actually turned off the um, the oceanic uh, uh, over, the overturning, uh, ocean ocean overturning, or conveyor, whatever you like to call it, and then led to the uh, the, cool, the younger dryas cooling. Was there another mechanism proposed for the for the switch off? And to see how the how the switching the flow of water could have caused. Oh yeah, so, oh yeah. Sorry, yeah. The, that was actually proposed by myself and Nick Shackleton in a paper in Science published in. Uh, no, I said Dick Kerr's unfortunately not here because he, he reported on it at that time. Um, it was 1975, 
and uh, we, Nick Chakra and I proposed, discovered this this uh, switch in the uh, in the water in the in the water from the south to the east, if you like. And the reason for that was that there was a critical meltback. There was a critical meltback of the south the southern edge of the Laurentide ice sheet um, that opened up the conduits to the east, and that was basically the, the then the the sort of the accepted hypothesis for the for the opening of that outlet. Critical phase of building the ice sheet. Why don't we see if there are any questions now from the telephone participants? Um, we have uh, two phones. One I know someone's on, and I'm not sure about the other one. So let's first go with who we know. Dagmar, are you there? Do you have any questions? Okay, and do we have anyone on the uh, call in line to the press conference? I guess not, okay. Um, do we have any other questions here from? So, why is this the first we've heard of this? This is the first we've had enough information together from enough people. You saw that collaboration. Uh, a lot of the members of this collaboration have never met each other yet. Uh, this is a collaboration that's occurred over the internet uh, over a number of years. And it's only in the last year or two that all of the, the spirit evidence started coming together into a common consensus as to what this all means. Uh, we knew there was an impact in Michigan, or we thought there was uh, eight years ago. But it wasn't until Alan started gathering data from all these other sites, uh, maybe two or three years ago, that we really saw the picture come together. And uh, now is the time to start the discussion of what this means. Uh, like, like Alan mentioned, this is related to a lot of things that are important to us, and it's important that we get this right. So we're just coming out with it now. Uh, the next thing you'll hear will probably be all of the criticism of our colleagues who haven't heard it yet, because if you haven't heard this, it's uh, pretty surprising. So it sounds like this is something that maybe some of you had suspected for a while? Uh, eight years. <laughs> And so did, once you found evidence that looked like it might be from an impact in Michigan, did, did you then start looking for similar evidence in other places? Well, there was a hiatus in our research. Uh, my top colleague, Bill Topping, uh, wasn't able to go out and see other sites, but he had gathered this evidence and shared it with me eight years ago. And we did initial prompt gamma activation analysis of the materials that he found, determined that indeed there were unusual things there. Uh, and then it stopped at that point. We wrote a short article in, in, in the Mammoth Trumpet, which I'm sure you all read, and uh, and uh, and then it kind of stopped there. And there were there were some problems with our arguments. We didn't have enough information, and uh, you could be dismissed as just a unique site that had some inexplicable information. I should mention at that site there are two microspherules per gram of sediment. That's an enormous number of microspherules. If you, we have more microspherules in our collection than in the rest of the world has collected in all of their research, I believe. So we really have found uh, the mother load of, of, of impact material, maybe because it's so new. Uh, and then it was about three years ago that it picked up again when Alan got involved, and then all my other colleagues here got involved, and uh, they all contributed important pieces to the arguments and redundant pieces, so we are quite sure there was an impact. Uh, when you start going into, did it kill the mammoths? Did it cause the younger dryas? Well, those are implications of our results. It's a little harder to prove that that happened. Nobody was there recording it at the time. On the other hand, if you if you follow what we all learned in, in, in undergraduate school, in chemistry at least, I learned Occam's razor, that if all these things happened at the same time, they're related. It's most likely the simpler solution. So we now have the confidence to really go forward with this and say, yes, we really strongly believe this. Uh, and we hope that your sharing it with people will, will spread the, the, the comment and, 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 and help us uh, really convince other people that this is an important, serious subject to be studied.